Uh, it's great to be here, great to be in Columbus. So quick show of hands, like how many of you are from, uh, are from out of town? Come here. Oh, oh, like almost everybody, that is great. Uh, so, so am I. Um, uh, and, but, I, but I love Columbus because, and this is like, I made these slides weeks ago. Um, I like it because this is where Ginny's Ice Creams got started. Um, they're here and they're in my hometown of Nashville. Uh, and if you haven't, so did anybody go there for lunch? Anybody, so what do you think? Yeah. So try the Brambleberry Crisp, it's the real thing. Uh, but Columbus has a lot going on. It's like there's a big, giant university here, so it's like got the arts and, and nightlife that you'd expect. It has a killer indie bookstore. Uh, but like, what I like is the weird stuff. It's got Topiary Park. Um, you should check it out. It's like right around the corner. It's walking distance from here, 10 minutes. Um, and it's like free Instagram likes, just like sitting there. <laughs> so why would you not? Um, uh, you, uh, the Drainage Hall of Fame is here. That's <laughs> a big tourist attraction. Uh, if you have time for a little bit of a drive, you can, uh, a little bit outside the town, there's a wolf sanctuary where you can meet actual, like, live, they call them ambassador wolves because wolves are nature's diplomats. <laughs> Cornhenge is here. I feel like Jimmy Fallon. We have a great show for you tonight, folks. Cornhenge is here. And they play a little football, I guess. I don't really know. Don't try and drive tomorrow is the advice that I got. Um, so I bring up football because football is my excuse uh, for not knowing anything about Columbus when I was <clears throat> at the impressionable age where I could like actually learn the names of cities. I only learned the ones that had pro sports teams um, because I grew up in suburbia in the 1980s. And it was a weird time. Anyway, so I knew that Cleveland was a great American city, like right up there with New York and Chicago and like Green Bay. Um, and I knew <laughs> about Cincinnati and I could even like, I, I knew what these cities looked like on a Monday night from a blimp. But, <laughs> but not Columbus, even though they're like the same size city. Um, and I just like this week found out what the deal is. It's, it's that Columbus has Ohio State and so they never had any use for the NFL and in fact to this day most people here don't know what that is. <laughs> the NFL has um, like an even more serious problem than that. So you see this, this is a report that came out um, July of this year, uh, researchers studied the brains of like 111 former NFL players and found evidence of brain damage in 110 of them. Um, and if I had to guess based on the league's response to this stuff, I would guess that they don't think that better equipment or schedule changes or rules changes are going to make this go away. I think they're acting like nothing's gonna help. And they could be right. Uh, and so there's a question, like, where does that leave us? Like, as a, you know, as a fan, I mean, I always knew that, like, a career in the NFL is not a walk in the park. It's risky, right? It's hard on the body, even if you stay healthy. And injuries happen, serious injuries, all the time. Um, but this is different. It's beginning to look like a career in the NFL is just a bad idea if you value your brain. Um, and as a fan, like, on the one hand, football. But on the other hand, like, I don't want people, like, burning up their brains for my entertainment. So you probably want to hear about Rust. Uh, but I like to start every talk with a lengthy non sequitur that gets really heavy at the end. <laughs> No, that really, it's like, I don't know how to give a talk longer than five minutes. <laughs> so enough about, uh, enough about serious dangers being ignored. Let's talk about C++. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm going to take a moment here and unmirror my display so I can see the words I'm supposed to be saying. That did not do it. Give me a second. All right. 
so uh, thank you for laughing. Um, I, I, I got the impression that, that there might be some people in this room who have used C++. So if you've used C or C++ professionally, could you just raise your hand? All right, cool. So the rest of you, just look around. Like the people that raised their hands there, like these people have seen some stuff. <laughs> like, they know how the sausage gets made. They know that all of software is built on this giant pile of sausages, and that knowledge haunts them. So for the rest of you, I just want to give like a quick impression of like, you know, what C++ has done to these poor people. Thread. So like, say you're writing some C++ and you have a variable, a nice integer here. Um, and you want to print the value of that integer, which for some reason in C++ looks like this. Um, well, this is terrible. This is a calamity. You forgot to initialize the variable. Um, so, so you're probably thinking like, <laughs> you're probably thinking like, well, C++ is, is going to like throw an exception that's very sad. Um, or, or maybe it'll print zero or something. Or maybe it'll print, like if you're really thinking, you're thinking like, oh, okay, so it's printing the value of a variable. We never assigned anything to that variable. So maybe it'll just print whatever random bits it finds in memory. Well, it might. <laughs> C++ might do any of those things, or all of them, because um, this is what's called undefined behavior using an uninitialized value. Uh, Undefined behavior is something that is uh, talked about a lot in the C++ standard. And what it means is basically your program might do whatever. All right? But this isn't the only way to get undefined behavior. It's actually several things that can happen. There's a couple more. I'm just going to talk about like one or two. Um, so say you've got a nice variable, an integer here. I initialized it this time, right? But I'm about to do something very stupid. I'm about to add up some numbers, right? Uh, this is a, what a loop looks like in, in C++, and I'm like adding up numbers, and this will work fine until the total gets too big to fit in like 32 or 64 bits, whatever an integer is. Uh, uh, and then, guess what? Undefined behavior. So don't do that. <laughs> One more real quick since I've got 30 minutes to fill. Um, so math is tough. Let's do something really simple this time. Let's just like pass an argument to a function. So this code right here, this is fine. This is, this is, this is safe. Um, like, because this is clearly crazy, right? <laughs> but this is totally fine uh, and will always work unless, Unless you're passing this, unless this function takes its argument by reference, because then what could happen is it could be like storing the reference somewhere to use it later, right? Now, in a language with garbage collection, that would be fine, because, you know, you have a reference to something, and the system basically just keeps it alive as long as you need it. In C++, once this code is done running, this, and the, the string leaves scope, that string is dismantled, and the parts are taken away. So it's like, it's for real gone. So what happens the next time your program tries to print a prompt? Undefined behavior. So don't do this. <laughs> There's a couple more things. <laughs> I'm just going to go through them quickly because life is short. Oh, I had to make the font size smaller. Uh, accessing off the end of an array, nobody ever does that, right? Undefined behavior. Uh, don't assign, the, assigning things is scary. This is, some of these things are like, uh, yeah, don't, don't modify a container while you're iterating over it. You'll get undefined behavior. Oh, and if you try and use threads in C++, that comes with its own whole set of rules. And it's actually like really kind of the hardest thing to get right in C++, so. <laughs> so don't do undefined behavior, kids. It would be bad. But how bad is it really? Well, it depends. There, there are like 
several things that could happen. I mean, well, anything could happen, right? But in practice, usually one of three things. Either your program just crashes and dies, and this is the good case. <laughs> because you're like, it's kind of like an exception. You notice it, right? Um, and there's actually tools, good tools to help you like debug that. Uh, the slightly worse thing is like, your program reads some uninitialized memory and treats it as data, right? Or it like writes some information in memory and clobbers something. Um, and then your program's just gonna be flaky from then on. Um, uh, or it, you know, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe nothing bad will happen. And if, a bug, if it doesn't bite, is it really a bug? <laughs> so then there's the other case. Like the other bad thing that can happen is that your program could turn against you. Um, this really happens because the thing is like the reason there's such a thing as undefined behavior is what's going on is <clears throat> the compiler takes your program, you know, it looks at this like integer addition or whatever um, and its job is to think real hard and like work on that code and then spit out a sequence of machine instructions that carries out what you want it to do, right? Um, so with undefined behavior the deal is the compiler sees your code, it, think, it works really hard on that code, and it just assumes that you would never do something so stupid as to leave a variable uninitialized, right? Because the compiler thinks very highly of you. <laughs> um, but then, when you run the program, uh, what's gonna happen is, like, obviously the behavior of, of, of compiled code that assumed something false is gonna be unpredictable. Um, not, predict not useful in practice, right? Not good for us as programmers. But it's still a program, right? And unscrupulous persons could like look at that sequence of machine instructions and figure out what your program is going to do after it goes off the rails. And this happens in practice. So, so Rust, right? This concludes our crash course in C++. See what I did there? <laughs> so we know Rust is, uh, is a safe language um, because it says so on the label right here. Safe. <laughs> I d thank you for the slide. Um, you know, it's funny, like in other contexts, the word safe, like the meaning is pretty obvious. Like if you're a young hero and there's an old guy and he says to you, it's dangerous to go alone, I want you to take this. Um, you don't ask like, well, dangerous? What do you mean dangerous? Because the fact that he's giving you a sword kind of answers that question, right? Like it's not the roads, <laughs> it's the monsters. <laughs> But if someone says, like, it's dangerous to go alone and take this and gives you, like, moves and ownership and references and a borrow checker and really long error messages, um, you might be a little perplexed. So, so the first thing I want to tell you here uh, is uh, to, to, like, resolve that mystery for you. Uh, Rust's notion of safety is best understood, I think, as a response to C++ and undefined behavior, right? So what it's protecting you from is undefined behavior and some other stuff, but mainly it's the monsters, right? Um, we've always known that writing a bunch of C++ is risky, right? It's, the consequences are bad if you screw up and programmers make mistakes. Uh, but it's starting to look like, now that we're a couple decades into this internet thing, now that we're seeing the consequences, uh, it's starting to look like writing a bunch of C++ code is just a bad idea. And we need a better way, right? We need a language that's as fast as C++ um, without the monsters. Wouldn't that be great? Without undefined behavior. Well, funny story. So, has anybody used unsafe code in Rust? I know at least one person who gave a lightning talk, right? Okay, yeah, okay good, cool. Um, so, for the rest of you, what is unsafe code in Rust? Well, unsafe code is code where you screw up and then 
<laughs> you get undefined behavior. Um, and like the saving graces, we put a label on it as, as it's unsafe. Um, but this, you know, this brings up a question, which I'm sure a lot of you have, which is like, why do we even have that lever? Like, in a language designed from scratch for reliability, like, why, why would you ever include undefined behavior? And for that matter, why does C++ allow it? Like, what, like, what, what is the purpose? Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is, like, is why we do that. Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while. I'm going to get around to it. Um, first, I want to show you some code. So this is actual real live code from the standard library, except with the comments removed, so it fell on the slide. Um, and this is uh, from the vec type. So this is the generic type that's a vector that holds values. Uh, you call this push method to push a value of type T onto the end of the array, right? So what does this actually do? How does this work? Well, the way, um, the way a vector works is you've got some memory set aside and you've got some existing elements in there, and then you've got some extra room, right? And push is gonna use that extra room to store the next element. Um, but the first thing this function does is check to see if actually your memory's full, because then it has to allocate some more memory, right? Uh, and it, it needs to basically, it works by doubling the size of the buffer. Okay, and then, ah! <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you, pu you push a value into an array, this code runs, and it gets a raw pointer into the, like, to the vector, um, and then it does some pointer arithmetic, like C++ style, uses an unsafe method, write, to like write data to an arbitrary address in memory, and then, just for good measure, it bumps this private field, like the correctness of which is absolutely critical to VEC not crashing. So is this, wait, is this sort of thing going on anywhere else in the standard library? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not going. Uh-oh, oh boy. Well, Rust is in good company. Think about it, like, what's a safe programming language? Java? What language do you think the JVM is written in? C. Quarter million lines of C++. Um, Python? C. Half a million lines of C, right? Here's, uh, here's the Ruby documentation for the, uh, the, the, their, their push method. Well, something I love about Ruby is you can, you can view the source of anything in their documentation. It's pretty neat. Oh, wait, Rust has that too. Um, <clears throat> so let's look. Oh, it's C. Um, yeah. So what about, like, what about a language designed by smart people, right? Like, what about Haskell, right? Haskell, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so Haskell, yeah, it's a little special. It has, like, a, 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 the Haskell runtime is actually written in Haskell. <laughs> Psych. <laughs> it's 50,000, 80,000 lines of C. Um, it's a garbage collector, right? You're gonna write that in Haskell. And that's not even all of it, right? Because like all these languages, all these programs we write, they run on top of an operating system. It's Linux, it's Mac OS, right? It's millions of lines of C. Um, when we think of like a safe language as being like this cozy, secure experience, we're like, ignoring all of the supporting code that has to go underneath that, right? It's a little bit of a fairy tale. The truth is more like, <laughs> like Saruman's Tower in Lord of the Rings, where you're like, okay, that's a nice tower. Like, that's clearly designed to be robust. But then, like, underneath it, you've got, like, this maze of goblin warrens, and, like, there's building code violations everywhere. <laughs> Oops. So, so why, like, why is it like this? Is unsafe code under every rock? Like, and, it, and if there is, like, how safe are we really? Is there any point in using a so-called safe language? Should we all give up and go be goat herds? That's the real question here. Um, uh, and if not, then how do we engineer safety in unsafe environments, in unsafe code? Uh, that's what the talk's about. You, you made it to the title slide, congratulations. <laughs> Okay, 
So that's a lot of questions that you just asked. I'll try and answer them. Um, first, I'll start with like, why unsafe code is a thing. Um, so there's like two basic reasons. One of them is, you know, <laughs> Speed, it's like just kind of the fact that, that uh, sometimes the safe thing to do, sometimes the safest thing is you check again, right? Like you check the array access, you make sure it's in bounds. Uh, you redo the lookup to make sure the table hasn't changed, right? Um, and in cases where you, the programmer, know that that's extra work, that's not necessary, it's just going to make things slow, you use a little bit of unsafe code and it goes faster. Uh, so that's one reason. But then there's another reason is that there's a lot of code that, like, there's a whole kind of code that you may need to write that isn't a very good fit for Rust's safety system. Um, because that safety system, like the moves and ownership and the borrows and all that, it makes some assumptions, right? And the assumptions are things like, well, all your code is Rust, then, then we're OK. Right? Because obviously, Rust can't verify anything that's going on once you call into C. And there's a whole bunch of C code that's loaded into every Rust program as soon as it starts to run, right? Um, so so, so the, that's why the interface between Rust and other languages is always going to be unsafe functions. The other big assumption is that there's no such thing as uninitialized memory. Like, this is actually a really great thing about the Rust programming language. It, it protects you from having that, right? Um, but remember the vector, remember how the vectors work, is by having a little bit of extra memory, a little extra room to use to put in more elements. That's uninitialized memory. How do we implement uh, vectors uh, in a language where you're forbidden from seeing that? See, there's a, like a, there's a comfort zone of like normal code that's the bulk of what we do, um, uh, where Rust safety system is a perfect fit, right? And then there are these, there are these parts. Sometimes you just have to say, like, look, I need to write code that's going to cross some lines here, right? Um, and I just need you, compiler, to trust me. I'm going to use some unsafe code to do that. When you run the Rust compiler on your program, what, that, what, all, that, what all that safety checking is doing, what the type system is doing, what the, what the borrow checker is doing, the reason you have arguments with the borrow checker is that Rust is building a proof of the soundness of your code, right? And all those, all those elements of the language, they're parts of that proof. Um, and you're convincing Rust that your code really is safe. That's what it is. Uh, unsafe code makes a gap in the proof. There's a, there's a part where, like, the Rust compiler just can't be sure it's right. It doesn't know, right? You're responsible for the correctness of that. This unsafe block in Rust, it really should be called trust me, right? Because like, that's what you're saying. You're saying, like, here, you know, I, I, I have looked at this code, and I've looked at this pointer right, and I've thought about it, and it's correct. Trust me. Now I know what you're thinking. I don't trust that guy. <laughs> Which is fair. A little hurtful. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's telling that it's in Rust that we have this conversation, right? I've been writing C++ for years. I never had to type, trust me. <laughs> like, I'm just going to XOR these pointers together. The compiler trusts me. It's crazy. <laughs> and uh, Rust is not quite so trusting, right? Rust checks. Um, even in an unsafe block, the type system is still there, right? Like, types are still checked. Lifetimes are still checked. Um, the only thing that's unlocked for you in, in this mode is you can call unsafe methods um, and you can dereference raw pointers. So now you know how to shoot yourself in the foot in Rust. Um, my last few slides here are about how not to shoot yourself in the foot uh, with unsafe code. These techniques, by the way, they're all classics. So you've all, there's nothing new from here on out. Uh, in, in, like, in good Rust tradition, this is like well-established stuff. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is don't do it. Um, <clears throat> but you know, we already talked about reasons you might have to. Uh, and the, th the things you need are like, you need to know what 
contracts are, and you know what, like, what, the contract is just the requirements on a function that you have to fulfill as the caller to use it correctly. You need to know how to use invariants um, in the types that you create to make sure that what needs to be true for that unsafe code to work stays true. Uh, and you need, right, you need this thing that comes from smug functional programming languages called the, like, <laughs> make invalid states unrepresentable. Um, these are, like, the common thread here is simply, like, you've got to be able to reason about your code because you know you're playing in territory where the compiler is not doing that for you. Now, these four techniques, I think contracts could, could uh, uh, use a little more uh, explanation. So let's go into detail about that. When I was getting started in Rust, um, I, like, one of the things I, I, couldn't, I didn't, couldn't figure out immediately was uh, whether or not a function I'm writing ought to be unsafe. Because like, here's, the, here's the push method, here's two versions of it. Um, the one on the right is the one I showed you earlier, the real one. But another way to write that is the one on the left where you just like put the unsafe keyword at the top there and then the whole body of the function is covered. Um, and this, like this, the language is basically just letting me choose whether my function's safe or unsafe, right? Um, which is kind of surprising for Rust. It lets you just pick, like, uh, I'm going to be safe today. Or like, and, and the rest of the language then trusts you, um, right? So, so this, is, this, is how, this is why that matters, right? Because the function signatures are different, right? The one on the left, um, everybody who uses it would have to know, whoa, that's unsafe. Now I need to decide, like, how... You know, am I, do I really want to call this? Uh, and if so, I've got to stick a trust me block in my code. Um, so what's the right choice here? And like, how much does it really matter? So, again, when I started out, my thinking was, well, if this code on the left is dangerous, we're calling this a dangerous pointer right, then obviously calling this function is going to be dangerous. So the answer is you use the one on the left, right? But of course, the one on the right is the one that's actually in the standard library. So what gives? Now what I think is that like, the one on the right is kind of like a key thing in Rust. Like Rust is a toolkit for making dangerous stuff safe. Right? Wrapping carefully written unsafe code in a safe API is the underappreciated cornerstone of Rust. contract of a function is simply the set of requirements that you have to use in order to, in order to use that function correctly. And every function has this in every language. It's not just Rust, right? Um, you call a function, you're supposed to pass a certain number of arguments of particular types, right? And sometimes there's extra things that you have to keep in mind in order to use it correctly, right? Um, and if you don't do that, if you misuse the function, then what? Well, and on a good day, like if you're using push and you pass the wrong number of arguments, right? The compiler stops you, right? Um, and in fact, that's enough for push. The, the set of rules that the compiler actually enforces based on the types and the bar checker and this, the uh, type signature, the function signatures, that's enough. Like that's, those are the only requirements to use this function correctly. Um, but then there are other functions like pointer right that are dangerous and they have a contract that's pretty complicated, actually. Like, if you look at the, at the documentation for this function, right, sure enough, it's got five paragraphs of stuff that you need to read in order to operate this thing successfully, right? The fine print of the contract, right? And it talks about things like the last paragraph is, the pointer must be aligned, which is like, like a thesis. Like, you have, to, you have to go and look up what that word means. Um, pointers are tough. But then if you, look at, if you look at vector push, no safety rules in the contract, right? There's this rule about panicking, in, like this is some bizarre corner case that happens when you have zero size types. Um, but panic is safe. Panic is actually kind of a bad name for it. It should be called like orderly emergency procedure. <laughs> That's catchy. Um, uh, yeah, but panic is safe, and it leaves, the, it leaves your program in a, in a good state afterwards. Even if one thread panics, the others keep going, um, and you can even catch it if you really need to. 
Uh, but there's nothing you can do with this function that's going to cause undefined behavior. Therefore, it should be safe. What that means, though, is dangerous, safe. It's on the implementer of this method, then, to make sure that they're using that dangerous piece in a safe way. Right. Um, and you can do it. Uh, what you need to do as the implementer of this method is you need to make sure that like, when you get to the pointer right on this line, um, that the data you're passing to it is correct and that your caller, no matter what they do, cannot cause you to violate the contract on that function, right? So this is, this is the, the basic idea, right? Um, so how do you do it? Well, you're passing this pointer end. Um, it comes from here. Uh, and that comes from this offset meth computation, right, where you like take the pointer to the beginning of the array and then you add some number of elements and get to the end. That, in turn, is valid if the length argument you pass it is actually less than the capacity of the buffer. Um, and there's an invariant in the vector class that the length is always less than the capacity or less than or equal to the capacity of the buffer. Um, less than or equal to. Equal to would actually be a problem here, and therefore we have this other code to make sure that if they're equal, then we double the capacity to make, it, to make room. Um, all the parts of this function are working together to make sure that one line of unsafe code goes smoothly. That's basically what, we, uh, what I wanted to say today. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that while you're in Columbus, you need to make a stop at Jenny's Ice Creams, get the Brambleberry Crisp, we learn what can uh, cause undefined behavior in C++, and we learn what that means. We now know what safe means in Rust, um, and why we have unsafe code, and we learned a little bit about how to use it wisely. So what? Um, well, notice that in certain times and in certain places, uh, engineers get this idea in their heads that they can, like, build a safer world. Um, it's funny. Uh, it's happened in lots of different fields at different times. It's happened in you know, medical equipment, airplanes, uh, space travel, um, industrial machines used to be incredibly dangerous, um, uh, highways. And when, when that happens, uh, we do safety engineering. We study failures. Right? We, like, we get inside them, we figure out why we have these failures, and we design systems um, to prevent them. So where are we right now with software? Like, are we safe enough? Like, is, is the code we write, is that safe enough? Is it good enough? And if not, do we think we can fix it? Or do we think nothing will help? I think we can do better, right? And if you go away with one thing out of this talk, I want you to understand kind of at a technical level, like how Rust fits into that effort, right? Sure, Rust prevents some bugs outright, and that is great, right? But it's, there's actually more to it than that. Um, Rust will help you understand the rules that good C++ programmers have in their heads that they got the hard way, right? Um, Rust gives you the ability to put a safe API on top of unsafe code and have reason to believe that it's actually correct. That's a great, like, that's a software engineering tool, right? A safety engineering tool. Um, Rust has expressive types so that, like, the types can cover more of the contract so that human brains don't have to. Um, and maybe best of all, like, Rust is economically viable so you can actually choose it and use it. Um, uh, and it can be your competitive advantage. Unsafe code isn't going away, right? If you're using unsafe code, if you have to write unsafe code for your job, you should be using Rust. Um, it's ready today. It's the right tool for the job. Let's do it. Thank you. I got one more thing. So my friend Jim Blandy and I, we wrote a book 
Um, it's, you can, it's in early access right now, you can buy it, um, and it'll be in print probably in January. You can, you, can, you, can get, you can absolutely get a PDF with like almost the entire book in it. <gasps> it's out of early access, I'm so sorry. Okay, I, I told you wrong. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Okay. Uh, well, you can pre-order it. Uh, okay, well, thank you, anyway. <laughs>